so titles. I, this message had two titles, and I wasn't sure which one to give it, but I didn't get it to Julie in time for any slides, so I can change my title. I was torn between calling it Surviving or Thriving or Whining to Winning. A lot of us do a lot of whining in life, whinging about life. And this morning I want to ask you a question. If you look at your week this week, did you simply get by? And if you were to look at, reflect on your week this week, did you simply just get by this week and survive every single day? Did you survive trying to get a three-year-old to put some trousers on when it's minus two outside? It's the battle we're currently having. Or do you feel like you're thriving in your week? You're kind of living the best you can. And the reality is we live in challenging times. But I believe God wants us to be people that are thriving and not just surviving. You know, there's two different concepts, thriving and surviving, and they're very distinct. You know, surviving is essentially about living a life of maintenance, yeah. where on the other hand, thriving means a life of abundance. Yeah. Yeah. Surviving is often very taxing, whereas thriving can be terrific. Surviving is often about duty, whereas thriving is about delighting in what yeah. God is doing among us. Yeah. Surviving is like the children of Israel in the wilderness, or thriving is like living in the promised land. Surviving in life is simply living life, while thriving means loving life. This week, did you love your week, or did you simply just live it, and you're glad you've got to Sunday, and you can start a new week again? You know, I believe as followers of Jesus, we are meant to thrive and not just endure. You know, it's a simple thing. You know, Jesus said in John 10, 10, that, that, you know, the thief came that to steal, kill and destroy. But I came that it may have life and have it abundantly. You know, Jesus doesn't want us just to live with mere routine. Average is not why he went to the cross. He didn't go to the cross for us to live average life. But he wants us to live this abundant life. But I'm aware that there are hardships, there are trying times that will be part of life. But this morning, I want to ask you, are you spiritually thriving or just getting by and i think it's important for often for me to explain to you sometimes where where these ideas for messages come from obviously they come from god but they often come from things we observe and you know this message has come from me observing a couple of people in the life of this church over the last year and kind of looking at them going why are they kind of at that point and many of us are not at that point that person you know i watched is annabelle i watched a lot of her life you know they she has had a tough year yeah. But I have never once seen her moan, groan, whinge, complain. All I see her doing is rejoicing, celebrating and thanking Jesus for what he's doing in her life and in his family's life. And, you know, that is something we should admire and honour because that is a life of thriving, not just surviving. She, not everything's going the right way at times, but she knows that God is on her side. And that's what I want to discuss with us this morning. And, you know, for me, thriving... It begins with rejoicing. The book of Philippians, chapter 3. The book of Philippians on its whole is a very joyous, joyful book. But the start of chapter 3, we're going to look through chapter 3, verses 1 to 11. And Paul starts this way. He says, what happens, my dear brothers and sisters? Rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Our ability to rejoice. So we keep the, the, them up there, Hannah, that's great, because we'll refer back to it at various points. We need to grasp the concept of rejoicing if we are going to move into thriving versus just simply surviving. In this one book alone, four chapters, Paul repeats rejoice 20 times. Wow. So I think it's pretty important. You know, I think it's, yeah, four chapters, not a lot of words, and 20 times he says rejoice. And he says, like, I never tire of telling you to rejoice. You know, he's excited to tell us to rejoice. You know, it's so simple just to go into survival mode, especially when things are tough, when things aren't turning out the way we want them to. You know, where it's so much better if we can step into rejoicing. We step into the gift that God calls joy, which means we turn from kind of this survival mode into thriving mode. That's why he says, it's no trouble for me to remind you again, because I know the power of rejoicing. Have you ever said this to someone? Someone comes up to you, on a Sunday morning, whenever, it says, how are you doing? And you go, I'm okay under the circumstances. Anyone ever used that phrase? Well, I think as Christians, 
We should never be under the circumstances. We're seated at the right hand of God. We have a victory and therefore we are not set by our circumstances. But it's so easy to say, but hard for us to do. You know, ultimately, Paul wants us to step into rejoicing. And he doesn't just say, look, guys, this is a really good thing for you to do. He's kind of saying, this is a command. Rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. He constantly is saying, come on, we need to be rejoicing. You know, the problem we struggle when it comes to rejoicing is we assume rejoicing is about happiness. And it's not. It's about joy. And there is a very different thing between joy and happiness. Happiness is dependent on circumstances. Joy is dependent on God. God does not change. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He is never under the circumstances, dealing with circumstances, or worried about circumstances. He knows the beginning and the end. And that's where joy comes from. Kay Warren wrote in, one of, in a book, she said, Joy is the settled, assur- the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life. That's what true joy is. No God is in control. No matter what it looks like right now, no matter what challenges I face, I must never forget that God is in charge. You know, do you, are you in that place this morning? Are you at that place of joy where you have a settled assurance that God is in control? Or are you busy scrambling trying to make things happen? This morning God wants to say, look, I've got it. I've got it. I've got you. Come into that settled assurance. She also goes on to say that joy is a determined choice to praise God in all things when it's going well when it's not when you're high or when you're low we choose to praise we choose to rejoice you know the nations are grappling with war and unrest at them at the minute but we can decide to put our faith in and honor god and allow ourselves to be joyful not really easy at this time of year we all get a little bit joyful you know people tend to come in and see a christmas tree that we don't worship and smile at it it makes you feel a little bit more joyful january is normally less joyful we're always a little bit more down in january probably because church is called fasting and that typically brings us down a little bit but you know we need to be people full of joy so this is what paul was saying at the start of the book of philippians come on rejoice find this joy But it's interesting as you read on, as you go from verse 1 to verse 2, the mood quickly changes. It's like the storm clouds are slowly coming in. And he kind of starts to say, look, guys, I need you to rejoice. But I'm going to give you some warnings of some things that will be kill joys. They will kill your joys if you aren't aware of them. This morning, I want to look at a couple of these kill joys, which typically force us to return to survival mode rather than allowing us to thrive. And the first thing he warns us about is counterfeits, falsehood, and religion. So counterfeits, falsehood, and religions prevent thriving. And I love the language here. Verse 2, watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. Pretty strong language. I don't know, I've never described someone as a dog or a mutilator. You know, it's pretty strong words he's using there. But he's saying, look, you've got to be aware of these dogs. Now, when he refers to people as dogs, he is not talking about the kind of little pet that you sit at home with in the evening on your sofa that cuddles up to you and gives you all the love and affection you want. These were wild street dogs roaming the land. That Actually, if you got bitten by the dog... The bite was the least of your worries. It was the infection that would come from the bite because they were carrying who knows what manner of disease. And these are the dogs that he's referring to when he refers to these people as dogs. You know, the risk came from the disease. And that's the same when we get ourselves involved in false teaching and misunderstandings in counterfeits of God. Because initially you think, well, that bite wasn't so bad. And then the disease sets in. Your thinking starts to change. So this is what he was saying. And one example of that is we need to make sure we avoid teaching and teachers that minimize Jesus while maximizing you. You know, they refer to these false teachers as um, Judaizers. Now, they were Jews that had followed Jesus, but were having a bit of a problem. They felt superior because they were Jews. They felt they had this kind of edge over, you know, the Grecian, the the Greeks, and all the Philippians. They were, we're a little bit better than you. We're we're Jews. You know, and they kind of felt this superiority. They were maximizing themselves above 
Jesus. And we've got to be so careful that we don't do that. It's so easy to sometimes fall into that place of maximising self. You know, even when you're doing good things, you're loving on people, you kind of do the right thing, but you can kind of find it becomes a little bit more about you than the people you're looking out for. A little bit more about you than Jesus. And Jim Jim Carrey hits the nail on the head with this quote. And yes, settle down. This one may shock a few of you. You may not like this, but this is the reality of it. It says, imagine struggling with being homeless and someone comes to you with a camera in your face to give you a meal and you have to take it. Imagine that feeling. He says, please stop doing that. If you go and help someone, do it with kindness and not with your ego. You know, it's so easy, you know, especially if you're helping people, you want to promote the fact that, you know, these people are in need and you want to help them. But you need to make sure it's about them and Jesus and not about you. You need to make sure when we're serving people and doing life people, it's about them. It's about Jesus. It's not about me. It's not about how big I look. I'm not about my ego and what I can grow in. So, you know, we've got to avoid people that maximize, maximize yourself and minimize Jesus. And you also need to make sure that we avoid falling into the trap that holiness is found in things we do yeah. as compared to what Christ has done. Yeah. You know, these, these guys, you read on, you know, it says, for we worship, for who we worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumstances. We rely on what Christ has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. What he's talking about here is these guys, again, were super proud. They were Jews. They were circumcised. They were putting real high effort in this. Man, I'm glad that's not the case today. You know, if you come, you're a guy, you come to Christ at 20 odd, I don't want to be going down that path. You know, certainly not a path we all, we're all very thankful we didn't have to go down that path. But they put a real high value on circumcision. This wasn't the only thing. You know, they were all about keeping some of the Jewish laws, the Sabbath, you know, the things they were to eat or they couldn't eat. You know, the no eating pork, shellfish, other things. They really kind of missed the fact that there was freedom in Christ. They were kind of real, like, no, we are good, strong Jews. And Paul really had to challenge their thinking about that. You know, they were kind of like, yeah, this is who we are. You know, they're putting putting value in their own efforts and their holiness in what they were doing. You know, and I love how William Bradbury, the great hymn writer, put it. He put it this way. He says, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking stand. What does it mean to follow Jesus? It means we let go of self and we grab a hold of him. We don't put value in what we've done, what our past is, what we've done. We grab a hold of who Jesus is and we accept that he died for us, for our transgressions. He to atone for them, then he rose again and we can build a relationship with him and through faith. And this is what he was alluding to, you know, in that verse three, it says, yeah, For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumstances. We rely on what Christ has done for us. We put no confidence in human efforts. It's not about me or the things I've done as a follower of Jesus. It's about the fact that I am a child of God. I can rest assured in that, that I am a child of God. Because when we allow this type of thinking to come in, what it leads to is a misplaced confidence in self. And a misplaced confidence in self, another word for it would be pride, prevents thriving. You know, he goes on to, Paul goes on, I love this, if you read verses 4 to 6, he says, Though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could, indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. When you start reading that, you're thinking... What's he going on about? He's talking about, like, kind of, oh, surely you're, this is the thing you were warning against. But he's trying to say, look, if anyone was going to have confidence in self, it's me. Yeah. You know, and he goes on to describe, you know, that you read on, you know, I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure blooded citizen of Israel, a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew, if there ever was one. You know, he's kind of like, okay, I'm, I'm laying out here in my CV. My CV as to why I could rely on self. You know, I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted his church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. He's kind of laying it there for you. And if you stopped at verse 6, you'd think, okay, right, there's some, okay, I've got to be this good person. I've got to you know, do all these things. But he doesn't stop at verse 6. If we read on through verse 7, it says, I, I once thought these things were valuable. 
but I now consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Problem Paul's trying to challenge here is when we get into misplaced confidence about our own abilities is we won't be able to survive because it becomes about my background, not about what Jesus has done. It's about what I can do, who I am, who my heritage is, not about Jesus Christ. And Paul is the greatest example of this as he's laid out there for you. He had all the right ticks in the boxes to be the perfect person, but he said, it's meaningless. It's worthless in light of what Jesus has done for me. And, but we need, to be, we need to be careful that we don't fall into this place of, missed, of misplaced confidence. And we typically find ourselves in that place very easily in today's, in today's world. You know, none of us are going to talk about that we're Israelites. I don't think anyone here is an Israelite from the tribe of Benjamin who was circumcised on the eighth day. If you are, great. But not many of us in the Western church could tick those boxes. But we have other ways in which we kind of allow this misplaced confidence to grow. And one of the things is we have this propensity to define sin and holiness according to our own standards that are not biblical at all. And I'll show you how we do this. You know, we go about each day and we kind of have a little ledger going in our heads of positives and negatives. And, you know, you think about all the good deeds you've done each day and you assign them a little number of points. You know, 10 points for this, 50 points for that. And then you also have the bad things you do each day. You know, oh, God, maybe I said something wrong there. That's minus five points. And we go around each day looking to make sure that we've got more positives than negatives. And the problem with that is, number one is we self-score. So we tend to big up the good stuff and downplay the little stuff in our own life. And then we judge everyone else and we big up their bad stuff and downplay their good stuff. So everyone else is in the negative, but I'm in the positive. So therefore I feel good about myself. And we kind of give ourselves this false sense of righteousness because we've got this good column looking bigger than the bad column. Now the reality is the Bible does not do that. The Bible says sin is sin. Full stop. And this is why... I believe, is, I believe the church has got itself into such a mess over things like gay marriage, over things like you know, relationships like, such as that way. Because in the church, we see this set of sin as bigger than that set of sin. And for some reason, the church has honed on to this one element of sin. But ultimately, the Bible says that all sex outside of marriage is sin. Yeah. Man and man, woman and woman, man and woman. If it's outside of marriage, it is sin. And therefore, he doesn't say, oh, yeah, but that's bigger than that one. It goes, no, it's this exactly the same. And therefore, if it's sin, we need to treat it as sin. We can't come down and throw the book at someone who's in a gay relationship while turning a blind eye to unmarried heterosexual couples that we know are also sinning. But that's the reality of what a lot of churches find themselves in. Because oh, that's a bit easier to deal with. Because on that one, you can just go and get married and it's all good. And it ticks a box. Now, there's, there's some, some arguments there about that because ultimately they still need to be repentful for the acts they're doing because they are sinning in front of God. And ultimately, we need to remember that sin is sin. And the way you deal with sin is you repent and you change your ways. Yeah. Now, the outworking of those two situations will be different. And that's okay. But the root cause is the same. The root cause is sin. And if the church can get back to that place of of treating sin as sin and not judging one set of sin bigger than the other, then I think we will find ourselves in a much happier, healthier place, thriving. Because the Bible says that marriage is between one man and one woman. That's the standard. That's what we go to. We say, it says sin, it says sex outside of marriage is a sin. That covers everyone. There's no special groups there. There's no special rules. Very simple, pretty much black and white. And if we can go back to that place of knowing that this is what the Bible says is sin. Sin is sin. Therefore, we treat it as sin. We can deal with it that way. And we can allow ourselves to get to a place where we're thriving. Because the truth is, as long as we're doing these kind of crazy classifications, they're absolutely useless to us in the long term. Because they provide us with this fictitious sense of security that we're living a life that is doing so well, but they're a lie and they prevent us from thriving. You know, on the day of judgment, you will stand alone before God. And in that moment, we can recall all the good deeds we performed, all the lovely letters we sent to people during COVID, the 
Ukrainian or Israeli flag that you put on your Facebook status in solidarity. You know, the thing, the people you helped cross the road, that time you gave the homeless man that extra double cheeseburger you bought at McDonald's. You know, we can recall all these things we did, but what's God's response going to be? He's going to say, your actions are like dirty rags. They're insufficient. The only thing that's worth it is what my son did for you. It's the, it's the, the punishment he took on your behalf. But when we go in with this misguided confidence, it will, can have and will have an effect on your eternal fate. Because our assurance becomes founded in works, not in Christ. You know, if you desire success in this world, if you desire spiritual growth... We've got to make sure we free ourselves of these killjoys and these limitations. We remove any misplaced confidence and we find the joy that comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ and said. And I'm going to close with what does this involve? There's three things I think that this involves to get to that place of moving from surviving to thriving, from whining to winning. Number one is you've got to embrace humility. Humility is what Paul said, whatever I've gained, I count it as lost. Saying, I'm humble enough to say, God, it's all about what you did. It's not about me. Yeah. It's not about my record. It's not about what I can do. God, it's about you. I'm going to humble myself before you. The humble words, you know, it's basically saying, I am nothing. He is everything. And from there, God builds you up. Then God starts to use you. But only when you come and humble yourself before him. It all starts there. We must all acknowledge that there is a God and he is not you. He is not like me or you if we want to succeed in this world. Instead, we must kneel before him, adore him, exalt him, give thanks for all that he is and all he has accomplished. And we must admit we are powerless without him. So the first thing you do is you humble yourself before God. The next thing you do is you set a new priority in your life. It's not about how can I make myself better? How can I do this for me? It's about God, how can I serve you? God, how can I show what you have done for me to my friends and family? How can I be a light for you? So we set a new new priority. You know, it's not look at all the wonderful things I have done. It's look at how great Jesus is. Look at the love he has given for me. The things he has changed, transformed in my life. So we must set this new priority. This new priority must be Christ first. And, you know, our focus should be how, not how can I be better, but God, how can I know you more? How can I get closer to you? How can I experience your love more? How can I become just this better person? If you want to become a better person, go and read the second book of Peter. I wrote a message about that this week and decided not to preach it. Maybe I'll bring it out another time. But just about him saying about becoming this well-rounded Christian. You know, to your faith, add virtue, add steadfastness, add self-control, add love, add brotherly affection. But becoming this well-rounded person, set a sight on being like Jesus, becoming like him. So we set this new priority that says, I'm going to follow and act like Jesus. And the third thing we do, which Rob has already alluded to this morning, we've been doing, is we make praise a lifestyle. You know, when we overcome challenges, you know, when we're in the middle of challenges, sorry, to praise him is not necessarily the norm. The world does not start praising normally in amongst the challenge. When they're losing, when a football team is losing, you don't typically see the fans praising them. Normally throwing a lot of abuse, a lot of words of wisdom, a lot of sideline managers come out, you know, oh, I'll do this better, you know. But that's not the reality. They're not praising their team when they're losing. But the reality is with God, despite the circumstances looking like you're losing, you're already on the winning side. The victory is already done. And that is the place that we praise him from. We press on to praise him. We praise him by faith, knowing that the battle is the Lord, that he's already secured our victory at the cross and at Calvary. We do not fight for victory. We fight from victory that Jesus already won for us. It's a fight of faith. A good fight of faith. This is what Paul and Silas did. Acts 16. Go and, go and look up that, that bit. You know, these guys are thrown in prison. You know, they could have easily gone into survival mode. You know, thrown in prison for preaching on the street. It wasn't even fair. You know, you couldn't get into all of that. But like, they sat in prison. And they could have just gone, oh, 
Woe is me, bit of whinging, you know, this is not fair. God, what's going on? You know, you called us to this place and now we're thrown in prison. But they chose to step out of survival mode and go, right, we're going to thrive in this situation. God, we're going to put you first and we're going to start singing hymns of praises. We're just going to start lifting our voice and praising God despite the circumstances. They were not under the circumstances, they were over their circumstances. And what happened? Their praise manifested victory. The prison shook, the doors were open. And they were freed. And, but they didn't run away. They just kept praising. They carried on singing, praising. Again, how many of us, we kind of realise that. We've got, God, I need you, I need you, I need you. So we start praising, then we get the victory. And like, right now, back to what I was doing. But we've got to stay in that place of praise always. When we're at the top of the mountain or at the bottom of the mountain. Whether we're doing well in life or not, we need to have a lifestyle of praise. Praise indeed brings freedom. Praise precedes a manifest, manifested victory. Praise takes us from survival mode into his presence and is here where we can thrive. And that is what I saw, you know, in the life of Annabelle. That's what I could see, you know. And you can play this out in every area and every day of your life. And I'll give you an example of how this played out for me yesterday. Some of you have seen yesterday, I decided to go and run a half marathon on the 2nd of December. Don't ever run marathons in December or half marathons. It was cold yesterday. Man alive. I did not expect this. Woke up yesterday morning, got to Plumpton where this race was starting, and it, my car was saying minus five. And I was like, I stepped out of the car to go and use the, the, use the loo. I was like, oh, wow. And I'm like shaking. It's bitterly cold. Stood there at the start line going, why am I here? And why have I paid to be here? I haven't paid to be there. It's not even like I decided to get up and go for a run. I paid to be there. And... So kind of got a bit over that, I was like, right, okay, and, and the race started, and away we go, and at 0.7 mile in, so not very far in, we're running up this dirt track, and there's a fuel lorry stopped in the middle of the dirt track, so we all stop, because nobody can get past, so we're there waiting there for five minutes, I'm like, well, this, this race is not going to plan, everyone's like, well, everyone's time's just gone, everyone's like, well, what, what, what are we going to do here, and then we came to the first hill, and Yesterday up on the downs, you could not see the top of the downs. So this hill just kept going and going and going. And I was running into the clouds and I was like, where are these clouds ever going to end? And at that point, I had a decision to make. My mind was saying, what are you doing? This is stupid. You know, I, I ended up walking at a couple of points of it. And I was like, you know, this is rubbish. You're never going to get a good time. What's the point in being here? You know, and I started to come up with all these excuses as to, okay, why it wasn't going to be a good race. But I was like, no, I've got a decision to make. Now, right now, this hill is humbling me because it's big. It's, and I, I checked out afterwards. The race is graded four out of five. I didn't check that before. I probably should have. Next time I'll have a look for the difficulty setting. This was a tough race. But I was like, God, there's got to be something I can learn in this. And what I realise is there's stuff I can learn. The reality is I don't need to come first. I don't need to be the best. I just need to get through this and learn what I can do. You know, and I just started to take a step back in my mind and go, I'm just going to enjoy this and see what I can learn in this. So I humbled myself. I set a new priority, which is, God, what can I learn in these next two hours I've got with you? Effectively, I was listening to a book and I was like, what can I learn in these next two hours? Switched my mind off to the fact that I was running a race and times, I didn't even look at my watch to know how far I'd gone. I thought, I'm just going to enjoy and embrace this time with you. And I just said, God, I'm just going to praise you in this and find the victory in this. And I survived. But more than survived, I thrived. I learned so much about myself in that because I saw there's an ability to thrive in the process. There's an ability to learn from it. So in every area of your life, you have an opportunity to be humble, yeah. to set a new priority, and to praise in amongst those circumstances. You know, running down that last hill at 11 miles, I suddenly I went to wipe my head and realized that my sweat on my head had frozen. It was that cold. I was like... Well, this is new. I've never experienced this before. I was like, this is a good opportunity to take a little photo. I was like, I might as well stop. Never before in a race have I stopped because I'm always like, no, you've got to keep going. But I was like, actually, I'm in a beautiful part of the world I've never seen before. Let's just enjoy it. Embrace it. God humbled me a lot that day. 
Not to the point where I'm going to stop running because I like running and I'll probably sign up to do something mad next year because that's just me. But I'm like, there's stuff I can learn. I was able to move from, survi from surviving to thriving yeah. because I was humble, I set a new priority and I was able to praise God despite the circumstances. And that's what we've got to do in our life. So I want to ask you as we end today, are you thriving or are you just getting by? God made us in order to have connection with him. Stop attempting to handle things alone. The do good and fail syndrome should not be attempted in life. Give your life to Jesus every single day. God will make you joyful if you do. God will make peace with you. And God will give you the profound contentment that the world never finds, but is constantly seeking. That's when you know you're in thrive. That's when you know you're thriving. If you're content, despite everything going against you, despite the wars around you in whatever's going on, if you can find peace and contentment, you're in thriving mode. You are doing well in your life. So I want to encourage us this morning. Let's stand. Actually, if we could get the band up, we're going to, if we can sing that last song again, because it just kind of sums it up nicely. It's about a lifestyle of gratitude and praise. You know, you can say, come on your soul. That's humbling sometimes to say to yourself, man, I'm not a good place, but I need to tell my soul yeah. to come on and get in alignment, to get in the right place. That also sets the new priority. You say, God, come and align with what God is saying about me. And then you're naturally praising in that place of praise so yeah let's stand and we're gonna i'll pray and then we're gonna sing this song again father god i thank you thank you oh god that you have come that we can have life and life in all its abundance life in all its joy <coughs> you called us to have a full and fulfilled life so god if any of us are simply getting by are surviving week after week day after day god help us to step off that place and step into thriving. Step into the joy which you set before us. To have that settled assurance that you are fully in control of our life. Every detail, every circumstance you are in control of. God, help us to make sure we're not having misguided, misplaced confidence in our own abilities, and our own backgrounds and the things we're doing. Help us just to realise that that's pride. And pride's going to stop us. But help us to be humble. Come before you and say, God, I need you today. I need you more than I've ever needed you before. Every single day, God, I need you. God, help me be the best I can be. Help me be more like your son every single day. Help me step into the place where I am thriving. Where I am reaching what you've called me to be. Where I'm reaching the place where you've called me to live. That place of your presence where I find peace. Where I find joy where I find your mercies anew, where I find your grace every single day to help me get through, where I find that I am in that place of thriving, that my friends and family look upon me and go, how are you so joyful in this circumstance? You say, because my God has got it. My God has got this, and I know we're going to come through this. God, help us to praise from a place of victory, not praise to a place of victory, that we have the victory, that it's won. That it's settled, it's done. It was done on the cross 2,000 years ago. And God, help us to fight from that place every single day and help every single member of this congregation step into thriving. May we no longer be surviving, but we are people that thrive every single day. Amen.